Welcome everybody to this week's The Group Chat with me, Will Perry, and Mr. Alan McAnally from Footy Accumulators and from Betfair. Good to see you guys. Good to see you, Al. And I'm going to start off with a punchy question for you, okay? Ooh. I'm going to the North London Derby this week, which is going to be great because we're going to have fans in there as well, albeit you know only yeah. 2,000 inside the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, but it's great to get them back. The North London Derby makes me ask you the question, Mm-hmm. Are Tottenham, Al, now a bigger mm-hmm. club than Arsenal? Oh, boy. Um, <clears throat> on the pitch, they are. Are they a bigger club than Arsenal? Gee whiz, well, I think they probably are. I mean, you need to look at sort of, you know, global position in the world of football. Um, the manager that's there is obviously, you would probably think, better known than what Arteta is internationally. Um, so I'm going to say, yeah, because I think they've been driving for that. I mean, the stadium is absolutely outstanding. Having said that, not only the Emirates either, because I've been in it and it's pretty fabulous. Mm. I mean, I think I might just throw that one right back you. I mean, yeah, Spurs, <laughs> Arsenal, who do you think is the biggest? Well, look, the I mean, flip side to that argument, because there'll be a lot of angry you know, Arsenal yeah, fans watching that and going, well, hold on. Listen, you've never whatever won the one you pick, yeah, whatever one you pick, well, yeah, exactly. They've never, yeah. Spurs have never won the Premier League, so Arsenal will say we are. Sorry to interrupt you there, but if you say Spurs are bigger, Arsenal are bigger, one and a half of North London is going to hate you. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough one, generally, to answer. But right at the moment in time, I've got to say Spurs are certainly doing more for me in terms of that than what Arsenal are. Yeah, and in terms of, you know, you've got to look at then the direction of the club, haven't you? Who is, who is going in the right direction quicker? And then you look at recruitment and you could say, you know, Arsenal have actually had a decent transfer window with the signings that they made. You know, Gabriel is a decent signing. Thomas Partey is a decent mm-hmm. signing. Willian, I'm sure a lot of top six clubs would have signed Willian. So they're not doing anything wrong, are they, in the recruitment department? But what's, what's happened to Arsenal? You know, they went and win the FA Cup. Right, they go and win the Community Shield. You win two trophies under Arteta, and then suddenly this season, it's just tailing away. I was at the game against Wolves, and all right, you know, you had the, the Jimenez injury and so on, but there was just mm. no no bite about Arsenal, and that's not what we expected. I mean, a lot of Arsenal fans, and this isn't even them getting carried away. They expected them to be going for the top four this season comfortably. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I don't think it's a bite. I think it's a genuine, real fierceness within the players. I think Thomas Partey might have it, and I think Gabriel might have it. But so far, you know, you're going to send Pepe into battle for you. I ain't. Mm. I don't, I don't see that. Not, not even remotely. The boy Tierney at left back's got a little bit about him because he's Scottish after all. It's always built into you, for goodness sake. So that's okay. But the, uh, re, the rest of them around the pitch, and you know I'm a big fan of Obama Young who's going through a real torrid time at the moment. I ain't sending many into battle. Not even Willian, to be honest. So yeah. I think it's a real problem in terms of the players in in recruitment, and I think you're right, I think recruited so far have been good, but you've got outstanding issues at Arsenal that are still not right with Ozil and with, you know, how much do you want it? How much do you genuinely really want it? And I think that's the finger you could point at a lot of Arsenal players rather than the fact that they're not particularly good players. You still have to have something in here. You Mm -hmm. need something in here that makes you give whatever little bit more you think you can give um, and at the moment in time, you know, I, I'm not sending many of the Arsenal play, fans, any uh, players rather, into battle for me. I'm genuinely not. Well, look, that's interesting because you mentioned a few names there. So I'll ask you this question and put you on the spot. How many of the Arsenal players would get into Tottenham's first eleven? So let's start with the goalkeeper. And look, you've never been a massive fan of Hugo Lloris. Would you have Burnt Leonard? Would he get in your, in your Tottenham team? To be fair, can we play without a goalie? <laughs> I don't like either of them, no. Uh, I mean, Hugo Lloris, to be fair. And I think he's had a decent season, actually, to be honest. Genuinely, I do. And he is a World Cup winner, and I'm going to have to side with him. It's just that if I had a choice of 20 goalkeepers, Lloris probably wouldn't be on my top 20. Mm-hmm. Leno's done okay, but to replace Hugo Lloris, maybe not. I'll go Lloris. OK, let's rattle through them, because there's, there's a few names here. It's quite an interesting one. So, you know, for example, Hector Bayer in. Would you have him in at right back instead of Doherty or Aurier? No. I wouldn't. No. Although he's although he's, he's done all right and he's pretty quick, but listen, speed you need you need to be more than just quick for God's sakes. Yeah, centre backs. I mean, look, David Luiz is that a silly question? I think I know the answer to that one. You're not going to have him, are you? Are you going to have Gabriel? He, he's behind. By the way, he's behind Lloris. I might play Lloris <laughs> at centre half before I play David Luiz. Are you going to have Gabriel? Good signing, wasn't it for yeah. for Arsenal? Uh, is he getting yeah, in instead like, of Eric Dyer? 
yeah, I, I still don't think as much as it's come out, and I've always said, I don't even know where Eric Styles' best position is. He wants to be a centre half, mm. but uh, and and he's done okay. But okay, okay, he's not enough, is it really? To be goodness, um, yeah. I'm I'm going to go Gabriel at centre half rather okay, than so Eric Dyer. Look, no, we've got one. We've got one at least. What about left back? You're a big fan of Kieran Tierney, uh, the Scotsman, fellow Scotsman. You sticking mm. him in instead of Sergio Regulon or um, you know whoever would play there on that left back position? What what I've seen so far, well, of Regulon has been really good. I really like him. I think he's going yeah. to have a really big future. Um, and naturally, as a Scotsman, I want to put Tierney in. But you, you've asked me the question, does Tierney get into that team? Does Mourinho take Tierney before mm. Regulon? And I say he doesn't. I think Regulon plays. Yeah. OK, a couple other names, because I know that there's some ones which are just stupid questions. So I'll give you some other big names here. Right. Are you going to stick Bakayo Saka in? He, you know, he's a fantastic little player and he can play anywhere. He can play left wing back. He can play part of that front three. But does he get in the Tottenham? I mean, he doesn't break up that Tottenham front three, does he? And he doesn't really... Um, kick Regulon out of left back? No, not really. Being fantastic, he has. There's, there's someone I would take in a heartbeat. Looks as though he gives you everything he's got. Tries his best. Got a trick. Mm. Hopefully has a wonderful, a wonderful career, uh, whether he's at Arsenal or not. But does he get into the Spurs team? Not yet. Mm. Look, one that might be on the line, Thomas Partey. I love him. We haven't seen enough of him in the Premier League to maybe make this decision yet. But, you know, you'd probably stick him in instead of Musa Sissoko, wouldn't you? Or, you know, Winks, whoever's playing in that position. Yeah, I've been playing before Winks. Um, I like Thomas Partey. You're right, we haven't seen enough of him. Uh, I, think he, he, I think he's going to be, a, you know, be one of the Premier Division players when we look back thinking, I think, he, you know, he came to, to Arsenal uh, and not the best team and made them better. So um, I'm OK with that one. Certainly Thomas Partey, I think, even a lot of Spurs fans would, oh, maybe not, <laughs> would maybe say that Party might just sneak into the team. And I'm certainly playing it before Harry Winks. Yeah. Uh, look, there's a few other names, people like Sabios and so on. But, you know, you, you're kind of, you know, you're looking at the way Tottenham play and he probably doesn't get in their team. So here we go. Mesut Ozil. Would he get in the Tottenham starting eleven? I like Mesut Ozil. And I know it's been a disaster year for him. Year and a half. Who's he replacing? Well, see, Harry Kane's been dropping a bit deeper in that number 10 where Rosa likes to play, so no. Mm -hmm. Even Lo Celso. What if you had Lo Celso in the 10 role? Would you play him there? No. 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 Okay, so two more. Willian, does he get in the Spurs team? And Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, the captain? No and yes. I think if Aubameyang was at Spurs, I think... Instead of who, Al? Instead of who on that front three? Uh, who plays on the left side? Son. Say, say, say Bale's fit. Say you've got Bale and you've got a fully fit Bale and you've got Kane and you've got Son. How does Aubameyang get in that team? I just like him. He's good. But yeah, you're right. Does he take either of them out? I think a year and a half ago, he replaces Son. But Son's been so good and genuinely has got better that you're right, Aubameyang, as much as I want to try and horseshoe him in at the team, probably doesn't replace any of those three that you've mentioned for sure. I think if Obama Yang was part of the Spurs squad, I think they would pretty much just about win that league. I think he's that important. And that right now at Arsenal, he's completely in the wilderness. And I know he doesn't play up top and wants to play out here like an Henri and, and, and try and you know, react to the game. They don't get him the ball enough. He's not, he looks as if he's hardly that interested. But I promise you, the boy is such a good goal scorer. But um, yeah, you're right. You know, does he replace Son at the moment? Nope. Does he replace Kane? No chance. Bale? Nope. So I don't, I'm going to, he can't get in the team. Yeah. Just finally on Arsenal and on that game at the weekend, you know, Arsenal fans are asking what has happened to their captain? This is a guy in Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, Al, that, you know, probably had a lot of options before he signed this new contract. He could have potentially mm -hmm. gone to Barcelona. He could have gone to a bigger club potentially. And, and he stuck around. He signed a deal. Uh, everyone thought that, he, that he'd take off where he you know, left off last time. And around the lockdown, he was smashing in goals. He's been played kind of out of position, out on the left. They've moved him back to, to this, the centre-forward role, which they did against Wolves. And he's been, he's been kind of ineffective there. What's going on with him? I have no idea. Genuinely no idea. I, he almost looks as if he's disinterested because I think he thinks that Arsenal are just simply not good enough and you know, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's unfair to say he's going through the motions. I'd much prefer him just to play him up top when things aren't going particularly well because if someone's going to nick in behind the defender, it's going to be a Bama Yang. But he's looked nowhere near the player he was a year and a half ago. Absolutely nowhere near it. Whether that's a reflection on Arsenal as a football team at the moment, just probably. 
you can't really ever go to the manager because I think the manager coming in at Arsenal has been a good idea to bring Arteta in. I really do. Because after all, you know, you're going to go through spells as a manager when your team are just not quite firing. This is a massive game at the weekend. Massive game. Because everybody's talking about Spurs as title challengers to Liverpool and Manchester City. You, 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 and obviously, they're, they're thinking we're the best team in North London now. So if Arsenal get something out of the game, it'll be a big shot in the arm for them. But it's going to be really tough. And if Obama Yang ain't firing, Arsenal are not going to win the game. Mm. Right. I want to talk to you about Olivier Giroud. Is he the most underrated player, not even striker, in the Premier League at the moment? And I'll throw some stuff at you just to, to back up this argument, OK? Mm. So... Giroud had only made one previous start for Chelsea this season before scoring four goals in the Champions League, right? Mm. He is 34 years old. He's got 11 in 18 this season, five of those for France. But to score four goals in the way he did at, at Sevilla, you know, who were probably one of the favourites to get to the, to the last eight, last four of the, of the Champions League. And he hasn't been getting a look in. They've signed Timo Werner. You know, they're playing Tammy Abraham ahead of him. But Giroud is just always there and always going to score your goals and never, ever seems to get, even at Arsenal, the credit that he deserves out. I agree. Um, talk about a player that doesn't get the position he wants every weekend and I never, ever see him do an interview or a newspaper column or online social media that he is disgusted with the manager, hates Chelsea, desperate to get away like a model pro. I mean, and I would imagine if, if Lampard says to him, look, I'm not going to play at the weekend, he'd be like, yeah, okay, all right, boss, I, I appreciate that. Now, he is 34, so he's getting to the stage where you certainly want to play. But at no time, no time have I ever seen him let Chelsea down. Mm. And, you've, and, player, and managers, and that's why there's a few teams at the moment, and we can talk about it, don't trust their players. But Frank Lampard can trust him explicitly and give everything that he's got to give. And I genuinely think at the moment, and Tammy Abrahams isn't in great form, by the way. If you're going to play someone at the moment and you've got the likes of Zayic and Timo Werner and Kai Havertz, if you're going to throw the ball into the box, there's only, there's only one outcome. And it ain't Tammy Abrahams. It's got to be Giroud. Because A, he has... i tell you what, he, Tammy Abrahams is a really good player, Will, right? But Giroud, with his experience and his knowledge of where his anticipation of the ball is going to go is much more relaxed when he gets there rather than the ball being a hot potato, if you know what I mean. As in nervously trying to get there. Giroud's okay with that. I think, I think he controls his emotions better than Tammy Abrahams does at the moment. And you only have to look at the way he's scoring goals. And there was a couple of instances actually last week where Tammy maybe probably could have got his head on. I think if it had been Giroud, I think it would have been a goal. But then again, it's, it's, all, it's all right in hindsight thinking about it. But Giroud's just gone and scored four goals against Sevilla that probably haven't been beat at home for 10 games. So I think that's how important he is, A, to the Chelsea squad. And Frank Lampard really must be genuinely thinking, I can't not play it. How can I go to him and say, look, I'm going to play Tammy Abrahams up top and I'm going to play Timo Werner on their own up top. It's got a really difficult decision to make Frank Lampard at the weekend. Well, Al, you, look, you said that Olivier Giroud never kicks up a fuss and he never does interviews where he's, you know, moaning mm. and whinging and so on. If you were Olivier Giroud and you just scored four goals in the Champions League against Sevilla, and don't forget, he scored the top stoppage time winner against Rennes, didn't he, uh, a mm -hmm. couple of weeks ago. So if he doesn't start against Leeds at the weekend, you'd be going to Frank Lampard's door at the training ground with a battle axe, wouldn't you? I mean, you're a striker, Al. You've scored yeah. four goals in a Champions League game and you're sat on the bench. Mm. You'd be more than a little bit upset. Oh, you'd be arriving at the training ground with a sledgehammer, for goodness sake, wouldn't you? You'd be like, hang on a minute, I'm not having this. But, you know, I'm, I'm going down the road of what we've seen from Giroud so far without really, you know, knocking the pins over and being unhappy. I just think it's a very difficult decision because at the moment in time, <clears throat> you can't say as good Timo Werner is, incidentally. <clears throat> um, Giroud right now is as hot as anybody in front of goal for Chelsea. And that's mm. why Frank's got a big decision. But, after a performance like that. And incidentally, it wasn't, you know, the first team, the, the main Chelsea team. And he was the reason why, you know, he could rest a few players in terms of Champions League with a big game coming at the weekend. And Giroud doesn't let him down. You know, listen, for a manager to have someone like Giroud in the team that he can A, trust and B, 
knows he's not throwing his toys out the pram because he's like, all right, you're playing me tonight. Oh, fair enough. Giroud doesn't have that attitude. And it's a brilliant attitude to have, genuinely. And to have him in the team for Chelsea, it's just absolutely brilliant. Because you could mention 25, 30 other players that if you did it to, you would know you'd be like, after 20 minutes, you'd be like, get me his number. He's coming off. Mm. Uh, look, just final Chelsea. How good a game is that going to be? I'm going to be there, Stamford Bridge, on, on mm. Saturday night. Chelsea against Leeds out. And, and I say that purely because I think back to the Manchester City game when they went to Ellen Road. And I'm imagining a kind of similar game that Chelsea are going to go for it. You know, Leeds only know how to play one way. And the, the Bielsa way, it's, it's a stubborn way of playing. But, you know, it's, it's all on purpose. He, he will, you know, not be going for draws this season. He only knows how to, to play one way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he, he, listen, he, he'll be hounding the ball. They'll be running in threes and fours and packs to try and put Chelsea at the back under as much pressure as they can. And Chelsea like to go forward. And that's how Frank likes to play. He likes to get his midfield runners in beyond. He likes to get Havertz as far forward as he can. Um, it's potentially a 3-2 job. It's a five-goal thriller, isn't it, with a bit of luck? Um, yeah. I don't think it'll be as easy for... I think Chelsea are expecting, with the form they're in, and we've just spoken about Giroud being fabulous and scoring four goals against Sevilla. I don't think it'll be as easy for Chelsea as you think it might be. I'm, I've been pretty impressed with some of the league play. Yeah. Your old club, Celtic. Neil Lennon is on thin ice, that's fair to say, yeah. isn't it? Uh, 11 points behind Rangers. I know they've got the two games in hand, but mm. I mean, everyone kind of thought the nail in the coffin was going to be that, that result against Ross County in the, in the League Cup at home, you know, to lose to Ross County 2-0. It was, a, it was a shocking result, but there were shocking scenes as well. And Nicola Sturgeon said those guys were despicable who were, you know, throwing stuff at the, the Celtic players and shouting abuse at Neil Lennon and obviously injured policemen as well. What did you make of those scenes? What do you make of what's going on at your old place? Yeah, that was, listen, the emotions are running really high and it's genuinely to do with the resurgence of Glasgow Rangers doing so well under... Now, under Gerard, they've been absolutely brilliant. They've been brilliant in Europe and they've been brilliant domestically. Last time they played, you know, Rangers turned them over um, and being beaten by Ross County is kind of the nail in the coffin for the fans to give it. No, we're not happy now. They can't obviously do that. And they can't do it now because we're in this pandemic and we're not many having crowds, and et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, for them to kick off with the cops and the whole thing and people getting injured, it's really horrible to see. It genuinely is. And I don't know whether actually that reaction by some of the fans, and it is a minority, and they might, you know, fans normally have their say, but I, don't, I still don't think them doing that would have even remotely swayed the, the, the Celtic board to say, OK, Neil's out of job. You know, they're stronger than that. And that's what I think fans have to realise, that just because you're going to kick off doesn't necessarily mean to say you're going to get your way. There'll be plenty of people that, are sympathetic with Neil in Scotland that are Celtic fans, that yes, know that Celtic have to be better, that the re re recruitment maybe hasn't been as good as they wanted it to be, which incidentally, better be good in January if they're going to spend money, if they're going to catch Rangers. But you can't be kicking off like that, the fans, because it just doesn't work anymore. It maybe used to, but it doesn't work anymore. So I think it was a pretty futile exercise by the fans, albeit as angry as they are, because they want this 10 in a row. That's what they want. Mm. And, and yeah, like you say, because Rangers have just not been in the mix for so long. But is he, you know, on, on borrowed time now, do you think, Neil Lennon? He's had some great times there as a player and as a manager. He won five league titles as a player, five league titles as a manager and counting. And then suddenly you've got the likes of Gordon Strachan being linked with coming back. And then you've got, you know, Henrik Larsson, who was probably a bit, a bit more exciting. Eddie Howe's name on the list. You know, Martin and Neil. Martin O'Neill, you know, you never go back out. I've been back to an ex-girlfriend. It never works out. You never go back. <laughs> but then again, Neil Lennon came back and won a title. So would you, would you have one of those two boys back? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I think, I think, I think, listen, Neil knows he's on thin ice. He knows the results have to be better. At the moment in time, he's still the manager of Celtic, so you back him and it's as simple as that. He has a history at Celtic that maybe almost no manager apart from maybe Martin O'Neill has had. You know, when Brendan Rodgers left, Neil came in, steadied the ship, triple, triple, you know, and then went on to, to win the next. I'm going to say there was something on the TV the other day. I'm going to say he's won the last eight trophies that's available to win, something mm. like that. Ridiculous. Some nine, ten trophies maybe, obviously, because the triple, triple plus the three. So maybe it's probably ten trophies, 11 trophies he's on. 
And you've got to take that into respect, sit genuinely. I take it into consideration with, with Neil doing it, but he has to get the best out of these Celtic players now because they are in such a slump. But he's on thin ice, and Neil knows that, especially when you start speaking about Larson. I don't so much about think about the Eddie Howe. I, I'm really not, I'm not having that one. I'd lay that one all day long with Betfair and, uh, and, um, and Martin O'Neill, et cetera. So there will be someone that will always be interested in being a manager of Celtic. Of that, I have no doubt. But Celtic have to be better. And Neil knows they have to. Or eventually, they will part ways. Yeah, are we throwing McAnally's name in the hat as well? Uh, I think you would burst out crying every morning if you didn't, if you didn't think you were working with me, to be fair. <laughs> Especially after not going back to your ex-girlfriend. Uh, no, no, I think my, my time, listen, um, I, I laugh and joke about some of the people on TV now giving it. I didn't have the opportunity. I, I've never been asked to be a manager. I was an ex-Scotland international football player, did all my coaching badges and not one club said, would you like to be the manager of our really? club? So don't talk to me about having the opportunity. But yeah, that opportunity, unfortunately, that sip, uh, sip, that ship has sailed for me sailed. and I'll just stay with you guys and do my stuff at Sky. Lovely. Well, it's lovely to have you. Anyway, um, look, I want to talk to you about the Champions League clubs in England who are most mm. likely to win the competition. We, we know that obviously Manchester City are going to top their group, Chelsea are going to top their group, and it's going to be fascinating to see who they draw in the round of 16 because there's some big hitters in there. And, you know, Manchester mm. United now scrapping to, to make the knockout stage as well. Out of what you've seen of the Premier League clubs, who do you fancy the most? Well, Liverpool. They had a great result the other night, by the way against Ajax, a really, really good result. Regardless of how they played, the way they played, the result was the most important thing. Probably Liverpool and Chelsea will. Um, Man United, like you just said, I don't even know if they're going to be in it. They've got a really tough game going to Leipzig. I know Leipzig defensively are not fantastic, but Manchester United will have to take advantage of that. I'd probably go Liverpool. Rolling out City. Rolling out City. Yeah, well, yeah, I am. Yeah, I am. I think it's going to be tough for them, genuinely. I think there's another problem with, with Aguero. Um, uh, and I just wonder whether you'll spend money in January thinking specifically about Champions League will. Mm. Um, and unless they do, I'm really not having City winning it. I think they might need to wait at least another season until he steadies the boat with the new players that have come in um, and losing David Silva, which I think is still... Genuinely, and I know you're a big Man City fan. I just, when I'm watching Man City, I'm still like, Silva could play this in a yeah. heartbeat. Mate, have you seen what he, he's doing at Sociedad? He's yeah, absolutely well, top of the league. Trees. Yeah. Top of the league. You know, so, and I'm like, and I, and, and I know I, I, you've, got to get, you've got to get over that now. David Silva's not a Man City player, but I'm just, every time I'm watching it and something happens and there's a little, you know, City are struggling just to, to do something that little bit, I'm thinking, Oh my God, David Silva could just light the place up again. Anyway, that's part of it. And that's a part of the reason why I think City, I don't think will win it because, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm pinning my hopes on too much that David Silva was just that good and De Bruyne and Foden and Mares and Sterling, etc. I've not yet picked up the baton. So I'm, I'm still going to go Liverpool and Chelsea's were best chance. Yeah, chance. it's interesting because a lot of pundits I've heard out this week talking about Chelsea being, you know, almost amongst the favourites to win the Champions League because mm. of the way that they play, because of the squad that Frank has built and that they'd be most Absolutely. equipped even ahead of Liverpool to, to lift it. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that, especially having Werner and, and Havertz. Although Havertz is young, remember. Zayech coming into the frame has looked pretty good. You know, he, he, I like players, you know how I like players that like to go that way. I was speaking about uh, Grealish the other day and they were saying, oh, you get booked all the time. And I said, well, if you're on the ball and you're going to take players on, there's a bigger likelihood you're going to get booked. So Zayech going that way, I like it. Getting fouls, getting free kicks, getting the ball in the box early. And if you can do that at the Champions League level, then you're going to cause mega problems because teams don't like it. Uh, even in the Champions League, even the best teams in the Champions League. And if you look right now, it's as open a Champions League, genuinely, than I've seen for ages and ages. Because mm. Madrid are struggling. Barca, okay. Juve, I know they won easy the other night. And, you know, guess who gets another goal? And Ronaldo. But I think this is completely and utterly wide open for the likes of Chelsea to go and put themselves in the, in, you know, in, in, in the beef end uh, of the Champions League for sure, mate. Really interesting game in the Championship this week, Al. Uh, Blackburn mm. taking on Brentford at Ewood Park. And, you know, you've got Brentford just in the playoff places, Blackburn just outside. But I'm going to ask you this question in terms of Brentford's recruitment is is 
unbelievable, isn't it? Rasmus oh. Ankersen has signed some, as their director of football, brought in some great players. And they, they know as a model of a club that they will bring in players like your, your Ollie Watkins, you know, like your Ben Ramas, whatever, and they will sell them on for a profit and they will work like that as a business. And then they'll, they'll go and find the next gem. And they look mm. to have done that in Ivan Tony, 13 and 17 for Brentford this season. He's only 24 years old, got him for a bargain price from, from Peterborough. And up against someone who is is really impressing everyone in the championship, former Newcastle uh, sort of front man, Adam Armstrong. He's got 15 and 16, only 23 years old. If you were a Premier League club, and I'm thinking of like, I'm thinking of your your West Broms and your Fulhams and why they haven't looked at these sorts of players. And you're going to mm. spend 20, 25 million plus on a player, just like West Ham have done with Ben Rama after that, you know, loan deal. Who would it be out of those two, Tony or Armstrong? <sighs> My goodness. Three in the bounce, I think they are now Blackburn. Armstrong mm. scored. Uh, I saw him scoring. I did the game. Uh, I really love him. They played really well. Barnsley. Um, he scored again. Yeah. And look, by the way, uh, okay, let, let, let's take them individually. Boy, Armstrong has made Blackburn a better team for sure. He is sharp. And I mean, right now he's in brilliant form. He's looking really sharp. He's looking goal dangerous. Quite diminutive. You know, he's not a six foot, you know, two job. He's a, he's a little, you know, striker that plays off the... The, uh, the shoulder of defenders and looks to get in behind, etc. Um, but he's done so well. The boy, even I, I, Ivan Tony, uh, is a completely different kind of player. And right now, you know, you, you threw Fulham in and the light bulb came on for me. And I'm thinking, Mitrovic, Ivan Tony. I don't know. Yeah. Who's, who, who's Fulham's recruitment guy? Because right now, in time, he's on thin ice because. Mm. I don't think their recruitment's been particularly good at all. And Scott must be scratching his head. The good result the other day as well. My pa, you know, my ex-colleague, Stuart Gray's there, one of the coaching staff. You know, I spoke to him last season. You know, I know it was going to be tough. You've got to bring the right players in. And as, as loyal as you want to be to some players, you need to be pretty ruthless because you're going to want to stay in the Premier League. So, Ivan Tony for me, and, and I'm going to say five million from Peter with a will. Yeah. Something like that. I can't remember how much it was. It just might be the best five million that Andy spent in the championship so far because the boy's looking fantastic and he's not just scoring tapping, just scoring all times of go- all all types of goals. You know, in mm. Brentford, you know, having sold all the players that they've sold, are still at the you know the, the top end of the championship, looking somehow again into the playoffs, and, and all of a sudden, you know, they're selling even 20 for 25, 30 million. It's, yeah. you know, the, the business plan they've got right now is maybe the best in the championship. And certainly, um, what did you say, Ankiston, is, uh, it looks as though he's, he's the best recruitment guy in the planet right now. Shows you, doesn't it, that there are players out there, there are gems to be had. And you look oh. at all the money that Fulham have spent on the, the last two times coming up to the Premier League, that, you know, you could have spent five, six million pounds and maybe had a guy that could even do it in the Premier League with, with, um, yeah. with Tony as well. I watch, I watch midweek, well, sorry, just you know, when you're talking about players like that, I watch Reading midweek and they're talking about the boy Obi Ajaria, who does too much for me. Oh, there's a good player. There's a young lad playing there, Michael Elise. And, and I'm thinking... Somebody's got to be watching this, but he was fantastic. He eventually took him off because he, he went really heavy-sided. Sheffield Wednesday were down to 10 men, try to get that winner, and it finished 1-1. But there's certainly players in the championship that you're thinking, I can definitely make him into a Premier League football player. Yeah. Okay, here's the most pathetic story of the week, right? Oh. The great Lionel Messi playing yeah. against Osasuna, oh. and he celebrates by taking off his Barcelona shirt to reveal a Newell's old boy shirt, which belonged to another great, Diego Maradona. Obviously, the two were very close. Maradona had managed him. They were friends, you know. And he has been fined, Lionel Messi, £543. Ridiculous. And Barcelona fined £162 by the Spanish Football Federation. I get you can't have political messages, but there has to be, Al, in this day and age, some sort of common sense where you look at an emotional tribute like that. You know, he was booked and he was fined. I mean, it just makes a mockery of it, doesn't it? There is a a law book, a rule book that the Spanish Federation have gone by to say that, you know, we don't want the next person to, to raise up something. Maradona did for football that probably no one got close to and I don't want this is the kind of thing that I want football players as a group to stand up at because this is so 
it makes me angry that you brought it up because I loved Maradona. Mm. If you got, I got to see Maradona. And I, I want all, this, all the Barcelona players, I want every player in the Spanish division to say 700 quid of a fine between them. Mm. I want them to say, no, we're not playing next week. It's ridiculous. Now, I know that's not going to happen. But in my head, I'm like, of all the things to find someone for, Lionel Messi, who has done for Spanish football that no one has ever done for Spanish football, incidentally, whether you're a Barcelona fan or not, and it infuriates me that something as worldwide phenomenon that Maradona was, that everybody knew Maradona, every single person who didn't even like football knew who Diego Armando Maradona was. And for the Spanish to, to find Messi... I, 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 I wish Messi inside is so seething that even he's given it, I ain't playing next week. I ain't having it. It's a joke. They'll say it's the rule book. You're like, okay. But there must be something around the thing. that is, It's not going, you know, that political message that you're talking about. We're talking about the biggest, one of the, if not the biggest. There's two players received, player of the century. Pele Maradona. And he was a god to a lot of us and certainly to Messi. And to, to, I mean, I'm, I'm ranting on here because I am raging that the Spanish, and even the, seriously, 543 quid, he got fined, you said. 543 quid. And Barca picked up a 162. It's a point. It's a point in that. It really, that really was a problem, eh? It's a joke, man. It's just a com complete and utter joke. Mr. McAnally, our favourite time of the week. It's ACA time again. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no comment. Um, you know what? This week, Sam's here from, from Betfair as well. I'm going to start. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm so sick of uh, getting wrong picks in the Premier League and in the Championship. <laughs> I'm going to pastures new. I'm going closer to, to, closer to home for you, Al, and I'm going to go for mm -hmm. Aberdeen to win oh, okay. at St. Mirren. St. Mirren knocked them out of the cup. Uh, last week, uh, Aberdeen, I'm going to go to get back to winning ways. Another third in the, the Scottish Premiership table. Uh, so an Aberdeen win at St. Mirren, Sam. And Watford, who I know Jill, drew nil-nil last time to, to Forest, but they've had a good unbeaten run, still up there in the Championship table, and they're going to beat Cardiff at Vicarage Road. What do you think, Sam? And just looking at the uh, the Aberdeen shout, first of all, I think you're, you're bold there. They're, they're even money to to go to uh, to St Mirren and and win. The draw is twenty three to ten. St Mirren, who are in pretty decent form, a, a two to one at the moment. Looking at the Watford Cardiff match, um, eleven to ten for for Watford to beat Cardiff. The draw, they're twenty three to ten, and Cardiff twenty seven to ten. Watford, um, you know, are are in decent form and 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 looking pretty sharp to to go there and, and win at eleven to ten. I'm bold. I'm feeling bold, Sam. I'm feeling bold, Al. Uh, that's what you've got to do when you've had a vision. You've just got to go with it, Al. So, what are you thinking? Yeah, I was going to say you've been drinking. I think that's where the problem is. <laughs> <clears throat> but nevertheless, uh, with a bit of luck, um, well, I, I was actually at Sheffield Wednesday uh, on Wednesday. Uh, who got a brilliant point, incidentally, defended for the life. Tony Pulis had a great job there, but Reading were really good, like really, really good. Should have won the game. Should have mm. won the game by two or three goals. So I'm going to go for them to beat, uh, they're at home as well, so to beat Forest, who are struggling a little bit for goals. And Reading look as though they've got plenty in them. So I'm going to go Reading, and I'm, go I'm actually going to go to Preston on Saturday for Sky. Mm. So, um, I mean, away from home, the home they've been brilliant. At home, they've actually stumped the world out. Um, albeit they did beat Chef Wednesday, who I've just mentioned, 1-0, which was the first result at home for ages, although Chef Wednesday had a man sent off as they had uh, the other night there. But I'm going to go for them to beat Wickham, who are obviously struggling, finding things a little tougher in the championship. So my two would be Reading at home to Forest and Preston at home to Wickham. Sam? Yeah, certainly Reading looking to, to get back to winning ways. They've sort of stumbled a little bit over the, the, the past few games. They're 13-10. to 10 to beat Forest at home. The draw, 21-10. to 10, And uh, Forest, 11-5 to 5 to go to Reading and win there. Looking at the Preston match, um, you know, Preston's form um, has, has been a little hot and cold, but they're the, the favourites at, at 3-4 to four against the newly promoted Wickham, who, like you said, are, are finding life challenging. 
They're seven to two to go to Preston and winning the draw is 13 to five. So all in all, our four fold this week, Aberdeen, Watford, Reading and Preston all to win coming out at around about 15 to one. But I'm sure we'll give that a boost for you guys. Sam, bring us news of a winner, please, next week. Look, we keep getting these wrong, Al. There's got to be four fits here. Yeah, and certainly coming up at Christmas, I think you should start wearing, like, uh, I don't know, some kind of elf suit or something, because you're always getting them wrong. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't let me dig back through the last 25 weeks, please, McAnally. Um, I don't like I'm... forfeits, because you say something you, you really regret. That's, I don't yeah. like that. No, this is it. Well, let's think positive. This is the one. We're, 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 looking, we're looking for Aberdeen to do the tricks for us at, at St Mirren, Watford to beat Cardiff, Preston to beat Wickham and Reading to beat Forest. Sam, top man, speak to you next week. Catch you later, fellas. Al, some really interesting games this week. Um, Chelsea Leeds, I think, could be an absolute cracker. You've got Manchester United going to West Ham. The, you know, David Moyes in charge of West Ham and he's got them... Your power up in fifth in the Premier League, the fly and the West Ham fans are actually looking forward to getting back into the stadium. And another yeah. one that really caught my eye, Liverpool Wolves as well. So some, some crackers. Who, who's going to win the North London derby? I'm going to go... I'm going to go Spurs. Yeah, Spurs. Okay. Spurs, I think. Yeah, Spurs. Yeah, which would be unbelievable for them. Top of the league, you know, winning a North London yeah. derby times for Tottenham. And in terms of that... that um, uh, the, 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 the David Moyes game against Manchester United I mean every time, single week we talk about Solskjaer don't we and it's like you know he'll go and win two games then he'll go and lose two games he's lost to Paris Saint-Germain you wouldn't be surprised if he lose to West Ham yeah. they're all calling for his head again before Christmas and then he wins every game up until New Year's Day yeah I know exactly I mean they are proper Jekyll and Hyde at the moment um, Manchester United by the way I was even I heard maybe Moyes he might even be getting an extra contract another contract brilliant that's what shows you how kind of crazy that football is because nobody wanted Moisey. Moisey came in, kept him up, no problem. And then has properly turned around the fortunes this season. It's a tough game for Manchester United. But we just like to think, United will go there, get beat, go to Leipzig and win 10-0. I mean, that, and again, Solskjaer stays in the job. Right now, and we've spoken about this, the, you know, the next manager to go, etc., etc., etc. Some of the decisions... At Manchester United for me, Solskjaer, I've just been weird, especially the other night there. Although Fred almost made it easy for him and he didn't take the easy way out because, you know, trying to headbutt somebody and not get a yellow card, uh, sorry, not get a red card was probably lucky in the first place. But it's a tough, tough game to go to West Ham. And you're right, Will, you quite rightly said West Ham are looking a completely different team than they were, you know, a year ago under David. Yeah. Top man, Al, good to speak to you, mate. We'll see you next week. Thanks, Paul.